Um, this morning, as has become our tradition on the last Sunday of the year, we'll be having three testimonies from people about how God has been working in their lives. I now invite Steve Gimme to read the scripture preparing for our first testimony from Kathy Marino. Thank you. Good morning. I'll be reading from Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 25 from the New Revised Standard Version. That day, a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentations over him, but Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women he committed to prison. Now those who were scattered went from place to place, proclaiming the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah to them. The crowds with one accord listened eagerly to what was said by Philip, hearing and seeing the signs that he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud shrieks, came out of many who were processed, possessed, and many others who were paralyzed or lame were cured. So there was great joy in that city. Now a certain man named Simon had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he was someone great. All of them, from the least to the greatest, listened to him eagerly saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they listened eagerly to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, who was proclaiming the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptizing both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. After being baptized, he stayed constantly with Philip and was amazed when he saw the signs and great miracles that took place. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. The two went down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit for as yet the Spirit had not come upon any of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power so that anyone whom I lay my hands on receives the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to them, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain God's gift with money. You have no part or share in this, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the chains of wickedness. Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may happen to me. Now, after Peter and John had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, proclaiming the good news to many villages of the Samaritans. May God bless the reading of his word. Now I introduce Kathy Marino, and as she shares this morning. Good morning. 
My name is Kathy Marino, and even though I am way out of my comfort zone today, this passage touched me on so many levels. When Philip went to Samaria to preach about Christ and all his goodness, the people were so receptive and they praised God's blessing. They were in awe of the miracles and healings, and I'm sure many Samaritans were found. I read, as I read, I began to consider all the ways and different kinds of healing do exist. Physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing, forgiveness healing, healing from loss, healing from disappointed expectations of friendships and love. I could go on and on. Healing can happen in so many aspects of our lives, and what a true blessing. Over 20 years ago, I was searching for what? I did not know. I felt that I was struggling in every way. My marriage had ended after 26 years. I was diagnosed with a lifelong debilitating disease. My kids were older, and the meaning of mom was different and new. Because of my new and scary identity, I was searching, but I was not sure for what or for whom I was seeking. Probably not unlike many of the Samaritans so many years before. My searching led me down many different paths, some good and not, some not so good. Mistakes were made. I released anger and fear in varied, ambivalent ways. In the midst of it all, I began to church hop, and I craved the perfect match. Because I felt so imperfect, I searched for a very long time. I visited liberal churches, very structured and by-the-book services, all kinds all the while constantly, constantly struggling with my own personal issues. So one day, a very dear friend invited me here to Brewster Baptist Church. I did come, but with my guard up, feeling so alone and frightened, I continually refused to let people in. It took months before I could actually sit through an entire service without running out hitting an emotional nerve, and I was out of here. But I kept coming back. Was it the Holy Spirit? Was it God? Jesus? Who brought me to Brewster Baptist every Sunday? Was it like the Samaritans who were there and ready to receive his holy word? I finally, after quite a few months, was able to stay for an entire service and I began to let a few people in. Something was working, and I feel so blessed to be here and a part of a loving congregation. They never gave up on me. And I was a hard sell. I know everyone has their own personal struggles, but I do feel that my spiritual healing is on its way. My faith is stronger, and my faith in people has assuaged my emotional barriers. And though a work in progress, I am so blessed and I feel so very fortunate to be a member of our Brewster Baptist Church family. Thank you and God bless you all. As we continue on to our second group, that we'll be sharing, I want to read to you Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16. It says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, Put it under a bushel basket, but on a lampstand, he gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works 
and give glory to your Father in heaven. Well, as we turn to this next group of people, you may recall back in September, there was a hurricane, Florence, that was threatening the East Coast and hit landfall on September the 13th in the Carolinas. And rainfall was not measured in inches, but in feet. And sadly, 32 people lost their lives in the state of North Carolina. Well, these low-lying towns in New Bern was hit hard, as in many coastal cities were, and they were affected thousands of homes and businesses. In the aftermath of the storm, many government agencies, NGOs, such as Samaritan Purse, came into the area to offer aid and assistance. For flooded homes, this meant essentially losing everything that they owned. Houses were stripped and soaked, interiors sprayed for mold and mildew. Well, BBC, we received a phone call from a church from Bryce Creek Baptist in Newburn. Several of their families had lost their homes or had their homes severely damaged. And they asked BBC for volunteers, people who had skilled laborers that could come into homes and repair these homes so the families could be back for Christmas. And they were looking just if we can get five volunteers to help out with one home and make a difference. And so we have some testimonies from some men who came and helped in need. Good morning. My, my name is Tom Wilson. Hearing Pastor Doug ask for volunteers to help get one family back in their home for Christmas, I remembered a special Christmas breakfast, a gathering of family and friends in our home. And I thought, how important those moments are to all families. And I saw a chance to help this one family be back home. It was my first mission trip, and I loved being part of a team with a shared vision. When we got to New Bern, I was moved by how many organizations and people had already stepped forward to help this family with cleanup after the storm and with preparations to rebuild. We were blessed to have fabulous host families open their homes to us, welcoming us and sharing time getting to know each other. Our New Bern hosts were wonderful people, good conversation, stories late into the night. Well, 9.30 felt late. We were blessed to have knowledgeable, skilled craftsmen on our team who saw what needed to be done and got working to fix it. Having lost everything they owned, I was moved by John and Chrissy Hester's positive attitude, profound gratitude, and determination to recover and move forward. I'm glad I was listening and able to hear the call. I'll keep listening. And good morning again. Uh, my name's David Hill. I was one of the uh, New Bern Five that uh, went down to North Carolina. Uh, I'm filling in for uh, 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 David Olson this morning. He couldn't be here with us. Uh, but he did uh, write down his reflections on, on our trip. And he says, uh, my experience with our North Carolina mission trip is that I've become closer to God. I was back and forth as to whether or not I should go. I asked my, my wife, Bev, what she thought. And she said, don't ask me, ask God. So after a lot of prayers and talking to God, he let me know one Sunday morning, a week before the trip, you are going. Uh, just before the uh, trip, I, he said, I ran into Pastor Doug and Jill uh, here at church, and I told them I was going to North Carolina. They said they had been praying for additional people to go, and they asked if it was okay with his wife, Bev. I said, she wants me to do whatever, God's want, whatever God wants. He, he writes, uh, it was a blessing for me and the opportunity to help others less fortunate than me to become closer to the four other BBC men, but most of all, I feel closer to God as I listen to what he wanted me to do. So I thought that was well done. Another one of our uh, trip participants wrote, Mission trips are more about the connections you make with the people you are helping and the people you are working with. Doing the work brings you together, and along with the work, the camaraderie, prayer time, 
<clears throat> prayer time and sharing is just as important. We go on mission trips to do God's work by helping others and we come away feeling equally blessed. Uh, my own personal reflection on the trip was very similar to what the other fellows had shared. Uh, but I had one particular um, thought that comes to mind. Um, three of us stayed with one particular host family and we retreated to, as Tom said, Southern hospitality. Uh, we were welcomed uh, graciously and willingly and accepting and um, it, it just could not have been uh, a more accommodating uh, situation. Um, three of us met our host family on Monday night as we arrived. We had worked part of the day on Monday and uh, we worked all day Tuesday Tuesday night, we sat with our host family and they said the upcoming weekend was their anniversary and they would be leaving on Thursday for a long extended weekend away. They said, here are the keys to our house, lock it up when you're done. I found myself thinking, could I have done that? Could I have turned over my house to three virtual strangers? I think it was indicative of, yeah, Southern hospitality, but also their openness, their appreciation, and of course their faith. Um, I think it's important to know too, I think we all are of a single mind, that we don't say any of these things, we don't do any of these things to boast or to brag or to pat ourselves on the back. Uh, we believe we are simply using the spiritual gifts that God has given us. Uh, this is what we're capable of. You're not likely to find any of us volunteering in the nursery or in the Sunday school or the office, okay? Uh, um, but we do hope that it encourages uh, each of you to explore your own spiritual gifts. Um, we all have them. They're given to us by God. Uh, we have many volunteers here at BBC. But there's always a need for more, as I said, in the office, Sunday school, audio booth. We always need help in the audio booth. Hi, John. <laughs> um, uh, we, hit, we, people, we need people uh, doing visitations, welcoming, ushering, you name it, we can do it. So if you don't know where your spiritual gifts lie, please consider attending Pastor Doug's upcoming sessions, a three-week session on beginning January 7th, right, next week. Um, just one last thought. We all have gifts. What good is a gift if you don't share it with someone? Thank you. Now, they came back from their trip, and unexpectedly, and part of joy, we get a thank you note from John and Christina Hester in New Bern, North Carolina, and I want to read it to you guys. It says, God bless you for what you did, and don't say, oh, it was nothing. It was really something. Thank you so much. To the wonderful souls who took time out of their own lives to come and help us rebuild, and their wonderful church who backed them up on their trip here and back. Thank you. I can't write the words down to describe just how much you impact our lives and the emotions of love we are feeling. The best description for my emotions is, it's God's grace. That is what pours out of those who came to help someone you never knew and treat them like family. Thank you. Thanks for the laughs as well. You guys are amazing. God bless you all, John and Christina Hester of New Bern, North Carolina. Well, good morning one more time. I just want to say that um, listening to Kathy's testimony and Dave and Tom, the second time around was just incredible because the first time I didn't hear it, I was so nervous thinking about it's going to be my turn next. So thank you so much. That was really wonderful. So my name is Ellen Summy, and I'd like to share with you this morning my personal story of how God has been at work in my life these past several years. It's an honor to be up here today, and my hope and prayer is that you clearly see the handprints of God over every word I speak. I had a dream several nights ago, or more likely I'd call it a nightmare, that you were expecting me to sing for you today which put me in a complete panic. So I'm so glad that I just have to share my story, but share it from my heart. Please let me start with Psalm 40, verses one through three, as they clearly speak to the condition of my heart and soul when God so beautifully intervened in my life several years ago. I waited patiently for the Lord. 
he inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from a desolate pit out of the miry bog. He set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Two and a half years ago, on August 12, 2016, my father, David Brownville, died suddenly of a heart attack. I'm sure that there are some of you sitting here today that have gone through a similar tragic loss. The hard thing about losing somebody so, that you so dearly love so unexpectedly is that there are no chances for final goodbyes or telling them I love you one more time. You're just feeling numb and in total disbelief that your loved one has basically just vanished. Our small extended family rallied around my mother and tried as best as we could to help her face each day without the love and companionship she had come to depend on for the past 61 years. My dad's final wishes were to be cremated and that there would be no memorial service. He had jokingly said many times that he wanted his ashes to be scattered into Cape Cod Bay off the back of the whale watching boat, the Portuguese princess. <laughs> we still have his ashes, but someday we will scatter them just as he wanted. So all of our grieving was done individually and in our own way, which can be a very sad and lonely thing. It was almost like if we didn't actively grieve, maybe it would mean that he really wasn't gone. I found myself withdrawing from friends and church, and the only comfort I found was spending time alone with God, reading scripture, journaling, and basically trying to figure out where do we go from here without my dad's presence in our life. My dad, David, was the major force that our family revolved around. He had a strong and likable personality, and when he walked into a room, all the attention would naturally turn towards him. He had his ups and downs, though. One day, he would be the life of the party, upbeat and joyful, and the next, he would be more content being solitary, working in his garden, reading, or sailing alone on Cape Cod Bay. One thing was for sure, he loved his family and children dearly and would fiercely come to their aid or defense in times of trouble. I have heard all my whole life that I look just like my dad, and there probably is some truth to the fact that I'm a lot like him in many ways. We all loved him dearly, and it was such a shock to lose him so quickly. And yet, as much as we all loved and cared for each other, there were times that I was left wondering why I didn't feel his love as strongly as I wanted to. However, life marches on, even in the midst of sorrow and disbelief. There was no time to grieve, there was a job to get back to, and now I had my mom to be looking out for as well. I waited patiently for the Lord to help me, and he turned to me and heard my cry. As the summer months turned toward autumn, we would have to start going through the year of first holidays without my dad, starting with his birthday in October. I found myself searching for something to help keep me busy during the long New England winter that was fast approaching. I saw an adult education course in tapestry weaving being offered, and I thought it might be something interesting to explore. Even though I'm not artistically inclined, I was willing to give it a try. From the very first moment of learning how to warp a loom and to actually weaving some bright colored yarn through the warps, I felt something start to come alive inside me again. It was like I was mending something back together that had been torn. In the six weeks that the class was offered, I learned a few of the basic weaving techniques, and from there I started to explore on my own, or so I thought. That first winter, as I would weave, I would pour my heart out to God about all the conflicting and sad feelings I was going through as I mourned the loss of my dad. God and I had a continual conversation going, and as each woven piece got completed, it was like my heart was being restored in the process. Together we would weave, and the grief got easier to bear, and God helped me to resolve aspects of my relationship with my dad that I hadn't seen clearly before. I was absolutely being reassured by my father God just how much my dad had loved me. 
He lifted me out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. As the winter months started to thaw and give way to signs of spring, the collection of weavings were starting to pile up, and this is where my story takes an interesting twist that even I didn't see. I started to share what I had been creating with a wonderful woman in my life named Priscilla Smith, who is an accomplished textile artist. She was so encouraging and affirming regarding the tapestries that I showed her. She understood, even before I did, that the weaving process was not some passing hobby, but had become a spiritually healing exercise for me. She felt so strongly that my tapestries should be seen that she invited me to be a part of a monthly art exhibit at the Meeting House Unitarian Church in Chatham. Never in my wildest of dreams had I visioned that happening, but it was an opportunity to step out of the isolation I had been in and to share my story of God's amazing healing power through an art practice. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in God. This past summer, which was the two-year anniversary of my dad's passing, I was given two more opportunities to stretch my spiritual wings a little further. The first opportunity was at the Wednesday night worship service that Doreen Mayer was instrumental in setting up, and the second was to be involved in the Inspiration Art Exhibit that was held in August here at BBC. With the help of Gail Chapman, Cynthia Linnell, and Dave Hill, we were able to display over 30 different artisans from BBC who shared their artwork and the God-given inspiration behind these pieces of art. What an amazing experience both of these opportunities turned out to be. Both of them challenged me to step way out of my comfort zone and into the company of some very talented and very caring people who I believe God placed in my path. Thank you so much for letting me share my testimony and how I experienced God working through an art practice to help me get through a tough time in my life. I hope that the next time you hear or read Psalm 40, that you will reflect back on how God comes to our rescue time after time. The death of a loved one can completely send you into a downward spiral of despair. God intervened in a unique way to help lift me up and put my feet back on solid ground. From something tragic, God was able to create something beautiful. He started a new thing in my life, and my only desire is to shine that light right back on his amazing love and power. The power to comfort us in our times of sorrow and to inspire us to step out of our comfort zones into new ways of experiencing his love. Maybe God has been wanting to do a new thing through you. Keep your eyes and ears open for opportunities because God will meet you anywhere, in the valley of despair, in the miry pit, at a weaving loom, or even at an art exhibit. Now one last thing before I finish is that I'd love to take this opportunity to share with you some of the weavings that God and I created together during this winter of healing. And while the pictures roll by, I'm gonna close with this poem, Life is But a Weaving. Life is but a weaving. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colors he weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow, and I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttle cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skillful hand as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave the choice to him. Thank you very much. I want to thank you very much, Ellen, for sharing how God has touched your life in the last few years with us. As we turn to present our tithe and offering, please join me for prayer. Heavenly Father, 
You are the creator and source of all good things. You continuously shower us with your love. Thank you for all the gifts and the blessings you bestowed upon us. We all know all these good gifts comes from you, dear Lord. And from these riches, we bring this offering. Our gifts we bring you come from our heart. And may you use the gifts for your purpose in this place and for the benefit of those that are in need. And we pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.